Hello and welcome to today's webinar organised by The Pathologist and Advanced Cell Diagnostics. My name is Rich Whitworth, Associate Editorial Director of The Pathologist, and it's my great pleasure to be the moderator of today's online event, which is called Elucidating Tumour Heterogeneity in Prostate Cancer by Combining Immune Histochemistry and Novel RNA in Situ Hybridisation. Please allow me to quickly introduce today's speaker, Nala Sivam Palanisami. Uh, who is Associate Scientist at the Department of Urology at the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan, and Adjunct Associate Professor of Pathology in the Department of Pathology at the University of Michigan. His research interests are on the discovery and characterization of gene fusions in cancer and understanding their role in carcinogenesis from translational research perspective. His laboratory investigates the transcriptional and genomic architectures of solid cancer genomes. He has also pioneered the application of next-generation sequencing technology for the discovery of new recurrent gene fusions in cancer, with the primary aim being to identify novel gene fusions specific for each cancer type. In addition, Nala has research interest in applying the newly developed target capture of all human exons and a resequencing approach to identify disease-causing gene mutations. His long-term goals are to identify novel cancer biomarkers for routine diagnosis and treatment monitoring. I should say that Nala will be on hand to answer any questions that you may have at the end of the presentation, but please remember that you can submit questions at any time throughout the webinar. So, without further ado, let me get today's webinar underway by passing you on to Nala. Nala, over to you. Hello. Welcome, uh, everyone, for this uh, web seminar. Uh, my name is uh, Nala Sivam Palani Swami. Um, I'm from the Henry Ford Health System uh, in Detroit, Michigan. Today I'm going to talk about um, the application of the novel RNA in situ hybridization that is combined with the routine immunohistochemistry uh, to evaluate the tumor heterogeneity, particularly in prostate cancer. The outline of my talk is going to be on the application of the RNA in situ hybridization method for the detection of uh, S gene fusion rearrangements in prostate cancer. Also, I would like to talk about the identification of uh, distinct molecular subsets of prostate cancer with the application of the dual ISC that is combined with the RNA in situ hybridization. To begin with, I would like to start with the with this slide, um, as you know, prostate cancer is being routinely classified uh, at diagnosis based on the Gleason pattern, that is from Gleason grade uh, 6 uh, and above. So basically, um, the Gleason grade, although uh, it is morphologically identifies a distinct um, level of the tumor differentiation, but uh, these Gleason grade patterns are not associated with any distinct molecular aberrations. Hence, <coughs> uh, based on the Gleason pattern, it is uh, almost impossible uh, to direct the patients uh, to, for, to any particular uh, treatment options. Uh, based on the recent work uh, on the copy number analysis and the gene expression studies on the prostate cancer, um, there are many molecular markers have been identified, that is particularly uh, in the S gene family rearrangements in prostate cancer, uh, which involves the ERG, ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5 gene fusions, which are fused with the distinct androgen-driven uh, 5' prime genes. Uh, which regulates the overexpression of the S genes. So based on the identification of this distinct uh, S gene fusions, uh, it is possible to classify the prostate cancer into distinct molecular subtypes. And further, uh, the overexpression of the SPINK1 was identified in about uh, 10 to 15 percent of prostate cancer, which are negative for any of the S gene fusions, and recently our group, we reported the identification of RAF kinase gene fusions in about 1 to 2 percent of the prostate cancer. So these molecular markers are not directly associated with any particular Gleason pattern. So that's the distinction I want to make here. We, we don't, these molecular markers are not associated with any particular Gleason pattern, but however, these molecular markers are uh, essentially helpful 
for the classification of prostate cancer into distinct molecular subtypes. The reason is <clears throat> with the identification of distinct molecular markers, it is for the first time it is possible to develop <coughs> uh, some therapeutic uh, inhibitors that is targeting these particular uh, molecular markers especially for the AIDS gene fusions being a transcription factors they are very difficult to target directly unlike uh, some kind like tyrosine kinase uh, in chronic myeloid leukemia and uh, other diseases or uh, AML4 ALK in lung cancer so the AIDS transcription factors are difficult to target directly uh, since it was highly challenging <clears throat> but recent work has clearly identified that indeed these molecules can be directly targeted with specific inhibitors. Like for the ERK gene fusions can be targeted with PARB inhibitors and there is a clinical trial that is already going on at the University of Michigan um, based on the AIDS fusion status <coughs> using the PARB inhibitor and combined with the abiraterone to see whether uh, the AIDS gene fusion status will predict the response uh, to the treatment. And similarly, the, there are small molecular inhibitors have been identified targeting the ETV1 rearrangement positive case as well. And similarly, the cases with the overexpression of the SPINK1 can be targeted with EGFR inhibitors and the RAF1 gene fusion positive cases can be targeted with the RAF or the MEK inhibitors. So given the identification of the distinct molecular markers and the therapeutic possibilities offers a new <coughs> kind of paradigm for the classification of prostate cancer into distinct molecular subtypes. It is not only the S gene fusion, SPINK1 and the RAF1, there are additional mutations <coughs> have been identified in prostate cancer here including the like P10 androgen signaling, AKT in the RAS, RAF, uh, all these different uh, driver mutations are also identified in prostate cancer. And these uh, markers can also be targeted with the specific inhibitors. So the identification of distinct molecular markers in prostate cancer offers a unique advantage, not only for the classification of prostate cancer, and also to offer specific therapy uh, for the patients. Uh, so based on uh, the inhibitors that is targeting for specific uh, markers, um, it is possible that all the patients need not respond, e even though they are positive for that particular marker, but some of the patients may not respond to the specific inhibitors. Uh, then uh, I think further molecular studies in these patients, if they develop any resistance, are required to understand uh, why some of the patients are responding to the specific treatment and why they are not actually responding. So because this could be based on the distinct uh, tumor heterogeneity uh, that is uh, existing in prostate cancer. So given the identification of a long list of molecular markers in prostate cancer and the available therapeutic possibilities, I think it is time to develop uh, some robust diagnostic methods for the identification of prostate cancer. So here, um, for the S gene fusions and the RAF and other mutations, there are different methods can be used uh, for, uh, for screening these molecular markers. Either we can use whole genome sequencing uh, or multiplex PCR or fluorescent in-situ hybridization or routine ISC. Any of these methods can be used. Uh, for the identification of markers at diagnosis in the um, patient samples. So what we, d we have done uh, in this area is, so here we, in order to uh, have a systematic molecular profiling of prostate cancer, uh, we developed a decision tree scheme how one can go about actually screening these molecular markers in prostate cancer. So here, uh, I'm starting from the top, First, from the uh, uh, from the post DRE screening and uh, from the PSA screening, uh, when the patient is elected for either needle biopsy or prostatectomy surgery, 
uh, immediately this patient material is going for initial morphological analysis. Uh, the conventional pathologist will uh, confirm whether uh, the particular specimen has a cancer or it is benign. Uh, particularly if it is a needle biopsy, sometimes it will be actually difficult to evaluate some of the atypical lesions, whether they are cancer or not. For that, additional uh, molecular uh, markers like AMACR and the cytokeratin staining uh, will be helpful uh, to resolve some of these small tumor foci, whether they are cancer or not. So once uh, the patient uh, sample is established to have cancer, we can actually do the systematic molecular profiling. So first, we can start with the ERK gene fusion because ERK is uh, present in about 50% of the prostate cancer. Since there is a well-validated uh, uh, antibody is available, the ERK uh, can be identified by doing the routine IHC. And uh, if the patient sample is ERK positive uh, as an optional, method, uh, it can be further validated by FISH uh, to know whether the ERK rearrangement is by 5' deletion or by translocation, because sometimes it is important to know uh, the status of ERK rearrangement, because some of the patients, if uh, or they are associated, uh, ERK rearrangement is associated with the 5' deletions, uh, these cases are known to have if these patients are elected for some radiation therapy and it has been reported that uh, some of these patients with a 5' deletion may not respond uh, to the radiation treatment. So for that reason, as an optional, FISH can be performed to confirm the ERK rearrangement status. So if the sample is negative for ERK, so we can proceed with the next one, uh, most prevalent marker, uh, the SPINK one for which there is a good antibody is available, so we can uh, do uh, the screening of SPINK1 by uh, IHC method. And again, if the patient sample is negative for both ERK and SPINK1, we can proceed with the ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5. So these markers can be screened only by FISH because there is no specific antibody is, uh, not, uh, is, is not available. <clears throat> so we have to do either by FISH or by PCR. So this becomes very challenging, especially when we are dealing with needle biopsy, where uh, you have a very small tumor foci. So it will be difficult sometimes by doing fish. We may not have enough cells uh, to make the diagnosis uh, um, appropriately. So for that uh, reasons, we have developed some alternate methods, which I will talk further uh, in the talk. So if the sample is again negative for ETV1 or ETV5, we can uh, do the next molecular marker, the BRAF and the RAF1. Again, this can be done by FISH, uh, because you all, you, although the antibodies are available <clears throat> because of the uh, some endogenous level expression of BRAF in normal tissues as well, it will make it difficult to make the call by ISC. So, <clears throat> uh, so the demonstration of the rearrangement by FISH is more actually confirmatory. So if the sample is again uh, is negative for either ERG, SPINK1, or ETV1, or BRAF, then uh, additional markets can be evaluated, like AR amplification, MIC, and the P10 loss that can be done either by FISH or ISC. So this is how uh, we uh, have a decision tree for the systematic profiling uh, of these prostate cancer molecular markers. So here, as you can see, given the number of molecular markers, sometimes it will be challenging uh, to screen uh, these uh, samples because it's time consuming and laborious and it involves both bright field and the fluorescence application and sometimes uh, often we may be limited with the availability of the tumor specimen as well. We may not be able to complete all the tests uh, in the given material. So for that what we have done was we have developed some new approaches for the screening of prostate cancer with molecular markers. So what we have done is, <clears throat> based on the availability of the reagents and the nature of these genes, what we have done is <clears throat> we, uh, we developed some multiplex approach for screening these molecular markers. As we know that ERG rearrangement is identified in about 50% of the prostate cancer, and ERG and associated with the loss of PTAN makes the prostate cancer more aggressive. Hence, we developed the simultaneous evaluation of ERG and the P10 uh, by dual color ISC. And, all, uh, and similarly, the ERG and SPINK1, uh, which accounts for about 50 to 60% of the prostate cancer, at least in the European-American cohort, 
so that both markets can be simultaneously screened by doing the dual color ISC, which I will talk more in detail in the subsequent slides. Then for the ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5, as I told you before, there is no specific antibodies available. Hence, <coughs> uh, so far, until recently, the tissue level expression on the FFP tissue has not been demonstrated for these genes in prostate cancer. So we, for the first time, uh, we developed some RNA in situ hybridization method, uh, which I will show you in more in detail in the subsequent slides. Then the additional markers like the PCA3 and the PCAT1, SLAP1, these are the new molecular markers that are established in prostate cancer, and these are all non-coding RNAs for which we cannot develop any antibodies, and the tissue level expression of these markers can be identified only by RNA-ish. Then similarly, there is a new marker uh, based on pseudogene that is expressed specifically in prostate cancer um, uh, that we are working on right now. Um, so that can also be detected uh, by RNA-ish method. So I will talk more in detail about each one in the subsequent slides. So first, I will begin with <coughs> the detection of ERG and SPINK1 in prostate cancer uh, by dual immunohistochemistry method. As we know, SPINK1 outlier expression, uh, which occurs in a subset of AIDS negative prostate cancer, and it has been correlated with an aggressive phenotype. And uh, it is, uh, we have also shown that SPINK1 may be a therapeutic target, and uh, methods uh, for the easy and rapid detection <coughs> is essential um, <coughs> so that uh, it will help in the recognition of patients who may have a more aggressive course of the disease and uh, they could be benefit from the developing therapeutics against these molecular markets, uh, as we discussed in the previous slides. So as we know that ERG and SPINK1 <coughs> are the two major molecular aberrations uh, compared to uh, other markets, which occurs less frequently, whereas the ERG and SPINK1 account for about 50 to 60 percent of the prostate cancer. So based on this, we developed this dual color ERG and SPINK1 IHC assay evaluate um, uh, in the PSA and in the PCA based on the automated immunohistochemistry uh, method. We, we, have, uh, we have used the Ventana uh, automated staining system for the simultaneous screening of egg and spring cone. So although it can be done manually, but we have developed some automated procedures uh, for doing this uh, dual IHC. Uh, I'm sure it can be applied with any other automated platform like DACO and uh, other staining systems as well. So the advantage here is that distinct localization of ERG and SPINK1, because ERG is expressed specifically in the nuclear uh, cells, and whereas the SPINK1 expressed only in the cytoplasm, which makes this uh, easy, uh, easy to actually interpret for the pathologist and the Brightfield application. So I will show you some examples of this dual ERG SPINK1 staining in the next slide. So we already published this work uh, based on uh, some initial analysis <coughs> in modern pathology last year. So we used the well-standardized antibodies, <coughs> uh, the rabbit monoclonal antibody for ERG and the mouse monoclonal antibody for the SPINK1 um, under, the, under the dilutions uh, that are indicated here. So the examples that I'm going to show here uh, the SPINK1, uh, here in the first example, uh, I show a, a tissue where we are showing both the uh, ERG and SPINK1 expression. The blue staining is for SPINK1. As we, know, uh, as we learned that the SPINK1 expression uh, within the tumor is highly heterogeneous. It is not like a more uniform expression all throughout the tissue, which is consistently we have seen in all the SPINK1 positive cases. The SPINK1 is highly uh, expressed in a heterogeneous manner. Here in this example, you will see the brown staining of the endothelial cells for the ERG. In the next uh, image, here, uh, this is a known positive sample. This is a metastatic prostate cancer uh, in pancreas, where you will see the strong blue staining of the normal pancreas, uh, and whereas the brown staining is for ERG. So you can demonstrate both ERG and SPINK1 on the same tissue in a single uh, experiment. So uh, when we did uh, the screening um, on uh, several cases, interestingly, we found a case where 
because initially we thought that the erg and spink one are mutually exclusive uh, they express in uh, only in distinct uh, patient sample and it is uh, for the first time we identified uh, a case where we found both erg and spink one are uh, expressed in the same tumor foci so in this example as you can see the brown nuclear staining is for erg and the heterogeneous the pink staining is for the spink one so it is for the first time we observed because of this dual uh, IAC approach, we were able to see a distinct subset of prostate cancer where we can see both ERG and SPINK1 expressing the same tumor foci. So in our further uh, validation studies, what we found was when we screen uh, some tissue microarray samples using this dual IAC procedures, we come across some interesting cases where <clears throat> in this example, uh, in one of the core, as you can see, here, this tumor foci is positive for ERG, and on the edges, we found a small staining for a spink one as well. So we thought, initially, we thought it could be some edge artifact or something like that, but uh, we did not give up at that level. We went to the whole prostatectomy block of this patient. As you can see here, these, uh, ho these punch holes uh, are the tissue taken for the tissue microarray. Still, there is a good amount of tumor left in this tissue block, when we did the dual IAC, <coughs> to uh, our surprise, what we found was there are distinct tumor foci. This is positive for ERG. The, all the red staining is positive for ERG. And the SPINK1 was in uh, another tumor foci where you will see the strong uh, actually SPINK1 staining. So here, uh, in these two examples, what I'm uh, <coughs> trying to convey is here is that this is uh, identification of a new molecular subset where we can find given the multifocal nature of the prostate cancer, distinct tumor foci may have a distinct molecular aberration. Although they appear uh, under the same Gleason grade pattern uh, under the hematoxylin and the eosin mm, morphological observation, but at the molecular level, they are completely distinct. So this is uh, some uh, new finding that uh, <coughs> we observed uh, in our analysis. So this is uh, owing to the advantage of using this dual uh, IAC procedure. Otherwise, if these cases are actually evaluated by single marker, one would easily uh, misdiagnose that these cases are either positive only for ERG or the SPINK1. We may miss such an important information of the existence of uh, more than one driver molecular aberrations in different tumor foci of a patient. So in the next slide, <coughs> I will show you in a more uh, in zoom in view of the same case where you will find the both ERG and SPINK1 are expressed in the, uh, in the same tumor foci. This is a different level of magnification of this case. So, <coughs> and this is another example uh, where we show uh, this is a large uh, tumor area that is completely positive for uh, ERG staining. This entire area was uh, that is positive for egg staining, but although you know within the same tumor foci, as you can see, a, a distinct uh, area in the tumor foci that is positive for both erg and spink one. Uh, so this is the zoom in view uh, of this one foci where you can see the brown staining is for erg and the red staining is for spink one. So even within this uh, tumor, where we are seeing a distinct uh, tumor heterogeneity where one area is only positive for ERK and the other area is positive for both ERK and SPINK1. So this is something interesting. This is not just an anecdotal observation. What we did based on this initial observation, we screened a larger cohort um, <coughs> Here, uh, that is highlighted in yellow, where actually two different studies, one from our group, one from the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, they showed that by using this dual uh, ERG and SPINK1 ISC procedure, they were able to identify about 4% of the prostate cancer are known to have actually the both ERG and SPINK1 in either in the same tumor foci or in two different foci. So this is for the first time that we were able to show that the uh, ERG and SPINK1 initially, although it was confirmed as a mutually exclusive genes, but now we started seeing that <coughs> they are the, what is called the exclusive pattern of expression of ERG and SPINK1 in the same patient and the same tumor foci. So what remains to be understand is what are the, you know, 
the clinical outcome uh, for the patients with more than one driver operation. So that is uh, <clears throat> the important question that uh, we need to answer, and a lot of work is going on in our lab. In a lot, we are screening a larger cohort to find out and associate with the clinical uh, data to see whether these patients will uh, behave anything different clinically and uh, <clears throat> in terms of treatment response as well. Um, so that is uh, the question for further investigation. So uh, to summarize the Ergen Spink 1 dual IHC, what I would like to say is the automated dual Ergen Spink 1 IHC, it is easy to perform, it is reliable and reproducible, and it is highly sensitive, uh, even to identify small tumor foci with the distinct molecular abrasions. And it can be done on a single unstained level, uh, enabling uh, routine subtyping of prostate cancer. And uh, this may have utility in retrospective or prospective stratification for therapy, prognosis, or uh, risk stratification uh, of precursor and atypical lesions. So although, as I mentioned before, uh, we confirm uh, only few cases in the initial study, so there are studies it is, uh, which is confirming the existence of a distinct uh, small subset of prostate cancer with uh, more than one molecular abrasions. So we need to actually do further investigation to see how these patients actually behave uh, in terms of uh, the clinical uh, behavior and also in, in terms of response to treatment as well. So I'm sure I think this is more convincing uh, with the examples that I have actually convincingly demonstrated the identification of distinct molecular subsets using the Ergen Spink 1 and dual ISC procedure. And the next uh, <clears throat> topic is, uh, as we know, that uh, the P10 deletion associated with the ERG rearrangement makes the prostate cancer much more aggressive. So based on this, uh, we developed the simultaneous detection of ERG and the P10 by dual IAC method. So here uh, we show the example. In the first example here, I'm showing a a case where the P10 was completely intact, that is a blue staining in the cytoplasm, and uh, this case was uh, negative for ERG rearrangement, so you see the endothelial staining of ERG, so you can see both ERG and P10. So in the next case, in the middle, where you see <coughs> this case was positive for ERG rearrangement, and it is a neg and uh, the P10 uh, status is uh, what's called a homozygous deletion, the P10 is completely lost in this tumor. And in the bottom, there is another case which is ERG positive and the P10 is not deleted. You will see the blue staining along with the ERG. And uh, <clears throat> in order to validate uh, our ISC's, ISC staining and as an independent method of validation, we did a fluorescent institute hybridization for the P10 and we confirmed that the case where the P10 deletion and the ERG was uh, positive, when we did the fish for the P10, we found there is a homozygous deletion of the P10 and whereas the other, the top and the bottom cases, the Petan status was intact, it was not deleted. And on the right, there is another case where the Petan was completely deleted, there was no staining of Petan, and by fish we confirmed that there is a homozygous deletion of Petan as well. So here, by doing IIC, we may not be able to resolve whether the Petan deletion is homozygous or heterozygous. And also the ERG Rearrangement, we cannot tell whether the rearrangement is by 5' deletion or by translocation. So that's why we are actually combining uh, this uh, dual IHC with a fish as an independent method of validation uh, to confirm the status of both uh, rearrangement and p deletion. I think this is a very powerful and advantageous method <coughs> to study uh, uh, because, as we know, uh, the even uh, within the tumor foci, the ERG staining uh, was uh, found in about almost about 40 percent of the ERG positive cases. The ERG staining was heterogeneous. It is not like every tumor foci is not positive; they're heterogeneous. And similarly, the P10 deletion also uh, found to, uh, uh, also reported to be heterogeneous as well. So that's why I think they're combining the ERG and P10 uh, both by IHC and the fish will uh, <clears throat> reveal uh, important information to assess uh, the status uh, of the molecular marker in the patients, okay? So next, <clears throat> so I think I have actually convincingly shown how we can actually apply the dual IHC um, for the screening, uh, for, for the simultaneous screening of the molecular markers and identify distinct molecular subset of prostate cancer. So next I would like to move on 
to the ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5 detection in prostate cancer. So as I discussed before, <clears throat> the, these genes uh, do not have uh, good antibodies uh, to see the expression level um, in FAP tissues at the tissue level. So far, until our recent work, it was not known the expression pattern of these genes in the ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5 rearrangement prostate cases in prostate cancer. And uh, as we discussed before, the small foci of cancer, because most of the routine diagnosis is, be, uh, is being done using the dominant tumor nodule, so it is possible that small tumor foci of cancer with uh, different molecular aberration can be easily missed. So that's why the in-situ uh, expression detection is uh, very important, uh, especially uh, in the prostatectomy or the hormone prostate tissues. And uh, so far, uh, the method of choice for detecting these rearrangements are either by fish or by PCR only. As we know that fish is too labor in uh, intensive and it's time consuming and it's kind of laborious. And sometimes, uh, depending on the availability of the small uh, tumor foci, we may not have enough cells to make a definite diagnosis by fish. And PCR, uh, again, you know, we know that there are actually several limitations because the need for uh, fresh frozen tissue to isolate RNA, all those things. <clears throat> and we do, um, but just by doing PCR, we will miss the complete uh, morphological information because whether the expression is homogeneous or heterogeneous. So because of these limitations, we develop the RNA in situ hybridization method using the RNA scope technology developed by the advanced cell diagnostics. So in the next slides, I am going to show you the detection of ETV1, 4, and 5 rearrangement in prostate cancer by RNA-ish. So what is the RNA-ish, uh, RNA-scope uh, in-situ hybridization technology? So in this slide, I would like to briefly describe uh, the RNA-ish technology. As you know, this technology is fairly new, although there are uh, several uh, methods or applications are developed by different uh, um, vendors, but none of them are um, really useful for routine uh, kind of diagnosis. They're technically uh, in, in a kind of challenging. And we found this RNA scope uh, is a uh, very useful and user-friendly technique and is easy to perform, so most like doing ISC. Um, <clears throat> so here, uh, the RNA scope, uh, basically it uh, uses for each target gene, so we can identify the uh, the NTF sequence can be used uh, to identify the target region uh, to develop uh, or actually design uh, these oligo um, oligonucleotide probes. So for each target gene, there are approximately about 20 pairs of uh, the Z probes are designed uh, to target the RNA. So to, in order to increase the sensitivity and specificity, uh, it is important that the Z probes need to hybridize always in pairs. When it is hybridized, and out of these uh, two, if, we, if only one of the um, one of the oligo is binding, it may not be detected uh, by the subsequent amplification and detection method. So it is essential that both the, uh, the the Z probes need to hybridize in pairs always. So each Z pair contains about 50 bases, and that is specific to target gene. And the rest of the workflow for the detection and amplification uh, of this, uh, this oligo after the hybridization is actually similar to ISC. So this uh, technique offers a uh, <coughs> very high sensitive and it is more specific uh, because uh, even the low level expression of the genes can be easily detected because every RNA molecule can be detected as a single uh, kind of dot uh, on the tissue. I will show you some examples in the subsequent slides. Okay, so we have actually mm, tested and validated this RNA scope technology both for uh, the genes uh, that uh, do not have uh, antibodies and also for non-coding RNA, that is PCA3, that is a prostate-specific uh, non-coding RNA. We have uh, uh, we have tested using this RNA scope technology, and also the pseudogene that I talked about, the KLK41, that can also be detected by the RNA scope. Because without this type of technology, it is impossible to detect the tissue level expression of these genes. So it is really very specific and a very sensitive um, technology, and we have successfully used this, and we have actually uh, 
uh, we are able to generate some important information uh, based on this technology uh, for the first time, which I will talk more in detail in the subsequent slides. So in the next slide, <coughs> so this is the paper that we published recently on the application of the RNA in situ hybridization for the detection of ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5 gene fusions in prostate cancer. So I will show you the details of this approach. So these are the probes <coughs> that are generated uh, from the different regions of the gene, like ERG, ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5. So you may wonder why I am actually generating probe for ERG, because <coughs> since we are, uh, we are using this RNA scope technology for the first time in our lab, we wanted to actually evaluate uh, the performance of the RNA is comparing to uh, ISC. So as I told you before, since we have a good antibody for ERG, I wanted to compare the performance of the ERG RNA is comparing to the ERG ISC. So for that reason, <coughs> uh, we developed the ERG. Uh, we used the ERG as a model gene to evaluate uh, <coughs> the performance of the RNA ish. So here we did some initial experiments to evaluate the ERG expression in prostate cancer. Uh, we compared uh, the expression of the ERG at the RNA and the protein level, both by immunohistochemistry and the RNA in situ hybridization. So in this slide here, I'm showing a very clear example where <coughs> we did, uh, uh, on one of the prostatectomy tissue, we did the ERG ISC first, uh, where you can see the tumor area, very specific staining uh, by ISC. Then on a subsequent uh, <coughs> section, we, we took a consecutive slide and uh, we did the RNA in situ hybridization. As you can see, the RNA is very specific only in the tumor cells and the no non-specific staining in the stroma or anywhere else. And we did not see any staining in the benign tissue as well. So here, <coughs> uh, so this is a very clear example where you can see uh, that the RNA is, is comparable, quite comparable to the ISC. The advantage here is we can uh, still, we are doing the bright field application because there is no fluorescence and detection is involved here. This is bright field and the signal after detection is highly stable and it is easy for the pathologist to review as well. Okay, so based on the <coughs> study, what we did initially, uh, we selected uh, several uh, ERG ISC positive cases and uh, several uh, ERG ISC negative cases and we performed RNA in situ hybridization and we found 100% concordance between RNA ish and ISC. We did not detect any false positive or the false negative cases. Okay, so uh, which tells, uh, because the, the advantage here is the ERG overexpression uh, is present only in the rearrangement positive cases. As we know that, the, uh, the endogenous level of expression is absolutely nil in either in the benign prostate or in the rearrangement negative prostate cancer cases. So we faithfully identified only the ERG rearrangement positive cases by RNA ish. Okay, so in the next slide, <coughs> uh, here I show you uh, based on the level of expression, because we know that the ERG expression level was not uh, the same level in all the cases, it is a little variable. So based on this, <coughs> uh, the, I think corresponding to the, to the protein level, we found there is a difference in the level of RNA-ish uh, signals as well. So based on the number of dots that we observe <coughs> uh, in different tissues, we established an evaluation criteria uh, from 0 to 4, where 0 is completely negative and starting from 1, 2, 3, 4, depending on the level of expression. When the expression level is very high, like we show in uh, <coughs> this example four, you will see more like diffuse signal rather than distinct uh, dots because when the expression is high. When the expression is medium level, you will see multiple dots which can be easily actually countered. <coughs> and it is easy uh, even to analyze under uh, actually even 10x or the 20x magnification. Okay, we already published uh, this uh, in this paper. Uh, you can see more details. So the next slide, <coughs> so we started evaluating uh, the ETV1 uh, RNA is uh, on the known positive cases, okay? So based on the initial success of applying the ERG uh, comparing with ISC, uh, we started actually using the ETV1 RNA is 
on the known index cases because we know that these cases were uh, uh, previously confirmed to be ETV1 rearrangement positive by FISH <coughs> because um, even uh, like ERG, ETV1 is not expressed uh, in benign tissues or in the rearrangement negative cases. Only in the ETV1 rearrangement uh, positive cases, you will see the high level expression of ETV1 in, in, in prostate cancer. As you can see in the tumor area, there is a strong uh, kind of specific staining, and there are areas completely negative where you don't see any, uh, any kind of intermediate or any background staining at all. So these probes are very specific and the staining is uh, very easy to observe. So in the next slide, <coughs> I'm going to show an example. Um, it, it is, uh, we can perform the RNA-ish, and not only on the prostatomy tissues, we can do it on the tissue microarray as well. So this is a tissue microarray where each case is represented by triplet and core. So uh, this TMA was not previously actually screened for ETV1. We blindly <coughs> did uh, the RNA ish on this, and we identified three positive cases. <coughs> All the codes were clearly positive, and uh, none of these uh, ETV1 uh, rearrangement negative cases, we did not find any staining, no, no background staining or any intermediate level staining at all. So such a very distinct and very specific staining that we observed in these index cases. This is three out of 96 cases. Uh, it was strongly positive. <coughs> and here is the zoom in view of those positive cases. Like every case, only in the tumor area, we see the strong positive uh, signal for the RNAs, whereas in the benign, in the, for the same case, we did not see any staining at all. And the rearrangement negative cases, you don't see any staining at all. So this is a very specific staining for the rearrangement positive cases, and all these cases were later confirmed by FISH uh, that <coughs> they do have uh, the rearrangement by using the ETV1 breakapart probe. Okay? So this is another case where we show the ETV4 uh, <coughs> uh, index case. We know that this case was initially confirmed by FISH. We know that it is a rearrangement positive. Again, in the TMA, <coughs> when we did uh, the RNAs, we were able to confirm a case where there is a strong staining of the ETV4. And uh, another example, uh, here I want to show you that the RNAs can be performed not only on the prostatomy tissue, not, uh, not only on the TMAs, we can do the uh, RNAs on the needle biopsy samples as well. <coughs> here is an example that is as a needle biopsy case where uh, we know that this case was actually in positive for TMPR assistant ETV4 gene fusion. When we did the RNAs, where you see very strong level uh, <coughs> of expression of ETV4 only in the tumor area, and there is no staining in the <coughs> non-tumor uh, or in the background area. So, so the staining, what I'm trying to say, is very specific, and you will not find, get any cross-hybridization or anything like that. Okay, so. so then the next slide, <coughs> this is an example of an index case uh, for the ETV5. Uh, here again, we show that the ETV5 only in the tumor area, the staining was very specific, whereas the stroma and the, the, in the benign area, you don't see any staining at all. So, what? <coughs> okay, in the next slide here, I will show you, this is to show the specificity of the probes. As you know that the... The ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5, they belong to the S gene family. They may have a high uh, sequence homology, so one would think that how specific these probes are. So to address this question, I challenged <coughs> this technology to see. Um, we took the ETV1 uh, positive cases, and on the same case, we did both ETV4 and ETV5 probe. And we found that <coughs> none of these, the ETV4 or ETV5, is not actually have, did not hybridize to the ETV1 positive cases. And similarly, <coughs> the other case where the ETV4 positive cases, and it is not positive for either ETV1 or ETV5. So which clearly demonstrate that the RNA is probes that we are using, uh, that is actually generated for each gene, is highly specific. It will identify only the gene of our interest. There is no cross hybridization despite the kind of sequence homology or anything like that. So we designed probes from the sequences that are specific for each gene, which provides a very clear and very specific results without any cross hybridization. So based on this, I think we think that 
RNA AIDS is a very powerful and alternate approach for the detection of AIDS gene rearrangements in prostate cancer. So based on these results, <coughs> we did a, a larger study. Uh, so we initially we did the known positive cases, the ETV1, ETV4, and ETV5 known positive cases, and we did about 319 unknown cases <coughs> comprising both metastatic and localized prostate cancer, and we were able to identify uh, a good number of positive cases both for ETV1 and ETV4. So interestingly, <coughs> what we found was like ERG, the ETV1 positive cases detected by RNAase we found the staining was uh, heterogeneous. It is not homogeneous for the entire tumor area. We, so since this is the first time we are seeing the tissue level expression of the ETV1, it was interesting when we observed that <coughs> the heterogeneous staining of ETV1 and ETV4. So in the next slide, I will show an example <coughs> of <coughs> the heterogeneous staining. So this is a tumor block from a prostatectomy sample where you see this is the hematoxyl and the eosin staining uh, of this tumor block. There is a large area of the tumor uh, was identified. And uh, we did the RNA-ish uh, on this slide. <coughs> so we found that the ETV1 rearrangement was positive in more than about almost the entire area of the tumor, except there are two areas uh, that was uh, still uh, uh, the same grade uh, of cancer, but they were not actually staining for the ETV1. So this is the heterogeneous pattern of ETV1. So initially we thought that it could be some technical artifact, it could be because of some bubbles uh, in the solution or whatever it is. So we repeated uh, this RNA-ish uh, on at least um, two different slides and we consistently found the same uh, area were not staining for ETV1. So out of curiosity, what we did was <clears throat> we took another consecutive slide from the same case. We did the ERG uh, IHC. Uh, when, I, when we did the ERG immunohistochemistry, interestingly what we found was the areas that are negative for ETV1 rearrangement were found to be positive for ERG. So it is for the first time that we show that Initially, until now, we thought that the ERG and ETV1 are expressed in a mutually exclusive manner, but here, for the first time, we are showing that in the same kind of uh, tumor, we are seeing both ERG and ETV1 <coughs> rearranged in a distinct uh, tumor foci, because uh, based on the Gleason grade, they're all the same level, but at the molecular level, they are completely different, okay? The ERG and ETV1 are uh, uh, different, and uh, subsequently, we did a fish analysis and we confirmed that only the areas that are positive for ERG was found to be positive by fish uh, <coughs> for ERG rearrangement, and similarly the ETV1 uh, is, is positive for rearrangement only in the ETV1 RNA is positive area. Okay, so this is for the first time we clearly demonstrated that uh, the distinct molecular subset of prostate cancer can be identified even for the uh, um, even within the AIDS family genes. So as we discussed before, <coughs> the ERG and SPINK1, we, we identified a case where you will find the ERG and SPINK1 overexpression in the same tumor foci. <coughs> but we did not uh, see within this uh, small number of cases out of these five cases, we did not find the rearrangement of the ERG and ETV1 in the same tumor foci. So far, we have seen this uh, rearrangement uh, only in distinct tumor foci. So in the next slide, I will show you another case where this is the whole um, prostate tissue. This is the HNE, and when we did the RNAs, uh, most of the tumors are strong positive, and still we found there are areas that are negative for uh, RNAs. We did the ERG IHC. In the next slide, I will show you the zoom in view of the area, where here, <coughs> as you can see, uh, this area was strongly positive for ERG, and immediately adjacent uh, the high-grade cancer right next to this tumor fossa was positive for ETV1. Okay, so here again, there's another case where clearly demonstrated the presence of the two uh, H gene rearrangement in two distinct tumor fossa. So we did not find so far uh, any case where you will see both ERG and ETV1 in the same tumor fossa. We did not find any case like that. I'm sure when we screen a large number of cases, we may find some cases like that. 
But so far, it is clearly we showed that the distinct tumor foci have uh, distinct molecular aberrations. So in the next slide, <coughs> what I would like to show is, instead of doing, since uh, we are, uh, we, since we have a good antibody for ERT, we can do by IAC, then for ETB1, we can do only RNAase. So we have actually made some improvisation <coughs> to do both ETV1, ISC, and RNA-ish for ET, sorry, ETV1, uh, RNA-ish, and ERC isc uh, on the same slide. So we wanted to uh, do that. So we developed the procedure that uh, just by doing RNA, we have to do RNAs first on the tissue. Then uh, we can subject the slide for I, followed by uh, <coughs> ISC. So it won't work if you do the ISC first and it is not suitable for RNAs because of the uh, all the antigenetical procedure, it may actually degrade all the RNAs. So I would recommend doing the RNAs first, then do the ISC. So in this example, we clearly show that there is a large area that is positive for ETV1 RNAs, and uh, and uh, here there is a small area that is positive for Earth. So this is the way that the first time that we clearly demonstrated the presence of the S rearrangement in two distinct tumor foci by combined ISC and RNA-ish. So this is, <coughs> uh, again, this uh, uh, we, <coughs> we can do it both by automated method and also by manual procedures. Okay, so the next slide <coughs> I wanted to show that uh, we know that the H uh, genes like the ERG and ETV1, although they belong to the same H uh, transcription factor uh, gene family, but uh, in terms of biology, they have distinct biology for the ETV1 and ERG-associated prostate cancer. So when we look at, <coughs> because um, there are only actually a few studies uh, that started coming up in the literature, uh, this is by Bina et al., they clearly demonstrated the ERG and ETV1, they control a common transcriptional network, but largely in an opposing fashion. <clears throat> so how? It is that ERG, which are negatively regulates the androgen receptor transcriptional program, whereas the ETV1, which cooperates with AR signaling by favoring activation of AR transcriptional program. And the ETV1 expression, but not that of ERG, which promotes autonomous uh, testosterone production. And the ETV1, but not ERG, upregulates expression of AR target genes as well as genes involved in steroid biosynthesis and metabolism. And the ETV1, which actually supports the development of invasive adenocarcinoma under the background of full PET and loss, because there has been clearly shown that the ETV1 or the ERG alone is not forming cancer in most models, but whereas under the PET and deletion background, both ERG and ETV1 <coughs> are shown to be actually forming invasive adenocarcinoma. So based on the distinct biology of ETV1-associated prostate cancer, it suggests that this disease class may require new therapies directed to underlying programs controlled by ERG and ETV1. So as we discussed <coughs> in the beginning, we have actually distinct inhibitors, like ERG can be targeted with PARP inhibitors, and ETV1 can be targeted with uh, small molecule inhibitors. So thereby, it is important to identify these distinct molecular subset of cases at diagnosis so that these patients can be directed <coughs> to select the appropriate treatment options. So since you know, more work needs to uh, be done to understand the clinical course of the disease in patients with uh, more than one molecular aberrations, I'm sure in the future studies will actually shed more light <coughs> on the importance of the uh, distinct uh, molecular subset of prostate cancer with more than one driver aberration. And uh, in summary, I would like to conclude this presentation in the summary slide where I have actually clearly shown example with examples that RNA in pseudo hybridization is a novel approach for the detection of H gene fusions in prostate cancer. The ERG SPINK1 dual ISC, which revealed a new subset of prostate cancer uh, with uh, ERG and SPINK1 overexpression in the same or independent tumor foci, which is a new observation. And we showed uh, clearly for the first time the ETV1 expression at the tissue level, uh, like the ERG and SPINK1, again, is showing a heterogeneous expression pattern. 
then by combining both the IHC and the ETV1 RNAs, we identified a new subset of prostate cancer with the dual SH uh, rearrangements in independent tumor foci. So far, <coughs> we thought that these genes are mutually exclusive, so and, uh, this is present in a, at least in a small subset of cases. And a further screening of a large prostate cohort may reveal the actual incidence uh, of cases with a SPINK1 and a dual S rearrangements. Okay. I'm sure uh, <coughs> any, of, uh, the, <coughs> any of the participants in this seminar, I'm sure they will actually do uh, more uh, in-depth screening in a larger cohort. And if anyone needs help uh, in this project, I'll be more than happy to share the protocol uh, and our experience in, in actually setting up this procedure in the laboratory. And it is not so far all this analysis is being done using the tumor, uh, what is called the index dominant tumor nodule that is being routinely used for the diagnosis. And we may miss even smaller tumor foci in the, when, when we look at the whole mount prostate tissue. So I think it is important that we need to do this dual ISC and the RNAs procedures on the whole mount prostate tissues to identify the distinct nature of the different tumor foci in prostate cancer, which is going to shed more light on the <clears throat> distinct molecular nature uh, of uh, individual patients. And also we can select appropriate treatment and we will be able to meaningful interpretation in terms of response to therapy uh, as well. So the distinct biology for H gene associated prostate cancer suggests that each disease class may require new therapies directed to underlying programs <coughs> controlled by H genes. I'm sure the future studies will shed more light in this area. So finally, I would like to acknowledge the people who are involved in this study, uh, Dr. Lashmi P. Kinju, uh, who is a pathologist who helped me in the evaluation of the uh, ISC and the RNA slides, and Scott Tomlins, who was the uh, who identified the H gene diffusions uh, in prostate cancer, <coughs> and Sharon Kaskadan, who was a technical assistant in my laboratory, who performed all these experiments, and Javid Sirtigi, who presented, uh, who helped me in getting the tissue samples, both the TMA and the needle biopsy samples. Cassie Smith and Alisa Tubbs are from Ventana Medical Systems. Uh, <coughs> they actually provided help and assistance by using the Ventana Discovery XP system for doing the dual ISC, <coughs> and Dr. Arun Chinayan, who's uh, <coughs> the director of the Michigan Center for Trans Translation Pathology. Uh, under his directions, I was working in the Michigan Translation Pathology. All this work was done in the University of Michigan. And with this, I would like to conclude my presentation, and I will, I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Nala, for, your, uh, for sharing your experience using this new technology. Fascinating stuff. I know that some of you have already requested the presentation, and it will be made available after the event online, as will the whole webinar, so, so you know. Uh, I should also note that you can find an interview with Nala by visiting acdbio.com forward slash researcher spotlight. Okay, we're now ready to start the question and answer session with Nala, so please feel free to submit questions as we go, and we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes. Uh, any questions that are not answered live today, though, we will be answered by email. So, Nala, are you there for the first question? Yes. Uh... Okay, so the first question is, which, which techniques are currently employed for biomarker analysis, and what are their limitations? Yes, currently, I think uh, for institute detection of most of the molecular markers, I think antibody-based detection is the current uh, kind of standard method for majority of the disease biomarkers. And it is because these techniques are easy to use and can be analyzed under bright field microscopy and uh, quantified using uh, some of the software tools. However, uh, some of the limitations are associated with the sensitivity and the specificity of the antibodies because, uh, um, moreover, the antibody performance varies under the different detection platforms. It varies between manual and automated platforms, even within the automated platforms, and different uh, kind of staining platforms, they uh, use different chemistry. And also, um, the suitable antibodies are often uh, unavailable for many of the genes. So with the lack of specific antibodies for most of the 
um, like the genes, like the transcription factors, like the one that we discussed in the seminar, like ETB1, 4, and 5, and some of the non-coding RNAs. RNA scope is the method of choice uh, for searching these biomarkers. Sure, and I think we've got time for one more question. So what do you consider uh, to be the importance of analyzing non-coding and pseudogenes in, in tumor samples? So it is um, important that, uh, I think based on the advantages of the next generation sequencing technology, uh, several um, cancer types have been extensively sequenced, and it has been known that there are several uh, non-coding RNAs uh, can be used as a biomarker in cancer because of their important role, uh, not only being an oncogenic, and also for their important role in uh, actual regulation of uh, many target genes. Um, so for that reason, because since these non-coding RNAs do not make any proteins, the uh, I think uh, RNA in situ hybridization is the only method of choice to demonstrate the tissue level expression uh, of uh, this non-coding RNA or the pseudogenes. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. So thank you once again, Nala, for your excellent presentation. And thanks to everyone else for joining today. Uh, and it just leaves me to say I look forward to seeing you at future webinars. So goodbye, everyone.